Hello, friends. Welcome to this book discussion at the Pune International Center. I am Abhay Vaidya, Director of PIC. I would like to begin by wishing our esteemed guests, our panelists, and all of you a very happy Gudi Padwa and a successful New Year. We are very happy to have with us well-known journalists Sagarika Ghosh and Rajdeep Sardesai for this discussion on Sagarika's latest book, a biography of Bharat Ratna, Shri Atal Bihari Vajpayee, India's first non-Congress Prime Minister to serve a full five term. Chairing today's session is Dr. Vijay Kelkar, Padma Vibhushan, and Vice President of Pune International Center. And we also have with us Dr. Raghunath Machelkar, Padma Vibhushan, and President PIC. If we were to name one leader whom India misses most in these turbulent times, of India's 75th year of independence. I think we would all agree on Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Undoubtedly, Vajpayee was India's most loud prime minister. A fabulous orator, consensus builder, a man in search of solutions, and undoubtedly a bundle of contradictions. Sagarika, you say all of this and more in your deeply researched book. The opposition called Vajpayee the right man in the wrong party. But Mr. Vajpayee rejected that outright by saying that he is part and parcel of the RSS, Jansang, and BJP. And how can you say that you like the fruit but not the branches or the leaves? Our guest speaker today, Sagarika Ghosh, is a well known journalist and columnist. She has authored many books, and one of them, a recent one, is a biography. Indira Gandhi, title, uh, it is titled Indira Gandhi, uh, India's Most Powerful Prime Minister. Her other interesting book is Why I Am a Liberal, a Manifesto for Indians Who Believe in Individual Freedom. Rajdeep Satyasai, we all know, has long years in journalism. He is the consulting editor of India Today and an anchor. And uh, he has authored a number of books. Dr. Vijay Kelkar, the chair for today's session, has served as chairman of the 13th Finance Commission. He has also served as the finance secretary and petroleum secretary and as executive director, International Monetary Fund, in charge of India, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Bhutan. I would like to mention briefly that Pune International Center is a policy research think tank now in its 11th year led by Dr. Mashelkar and Dr. Kelkar. PIC works in the areas of national security, energy, environment, and climate change, social innovation, urbanization and economic reforms, and technology and national innovation ecosystem. PIC makes recommendations to the state and central governments from time to time. And to give one example, PIC and Jnan Prabodhini's recommendation on support for gifted children finds reflection in the National Education Policy 2020. Last year, PIC's book, Rising to the China Challenge, by six authors, including Dr. Kelkar and Dr. Mashelkar, was published by Rupa. We regularly hold book discussions and public lectures on current affairs, and you are most welcome to participate in our events. Before I hand over to Dr. Kelkar, I would like to mention that today's discussion has a Q&A session and you are welcome to post your questions in the question box. Over to you, Dr. Kelkar. Thank you, Abhay. Uh, uh, on my behalf and my colleagues' behalf, I once again welcome Ms. Sagarika Ghosh and, uh, of course, Rajdeep Sardesai to PIC. I'm really grateful to her for coming on the holiday to Pune to, for this in person, that to, for this book uh, event. So the floor to you, Sagarika. Uh, what I thought that you probably speak of this like 15, 20 minutes and then we'll invite uh, the Rajdeep and uh, then we have a Q&A session. And at, the, at the conclusion, Dr. Mashilka and I will speak, if it's okay with you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Kelkar, uh, Dr. Mashilkar, Abhay. Thank you so much for inviting me to the Pune International Center. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a happy Guri Parva to all of you. Uh, it's uh, 
I'm very pleased to be here to talk about my new book, uh, Atal Bihari Bajpai. Uh, this is the biography of Bajpai that I've just published. Uh, it's part of a three-part uh, series that I'm doing on three prime ministers. Uh, the first one, as Abhay mentioned, is on uh, Indira Gandhi, India's most powerful prime minister. Uh, this is uh, Bajpai, India's most loved prime minister. And uh, there's a third prime minister, but I can't tell you who that is yet. Uh, that's, that's a secret between me and the publisher at the moment. But uh, uh, you will uh, uh, find out uh, pretty soon who the third prime minister is. Um, I think uh, the story of Atal Bihari Bajpai is particularly relevant in today's times because uh, Bajpai was someone who believed in the art of consensus. Uh, he was the archetypal consensus builder. He had a lot of disagreements with Nehru. He had uh, a fundamental ideological uh, opposition to Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister. But he learned from Nehru and he imbibed from Nehru uh, the art of uh, creating consensus and creating reconciliation and above all, locating his politics squarely in parliament. Uh, today, we have a situation where uh, we see a kind of almost unbridgeable gap between government and opposition. We see um, an ideological schism between the ruling party and the opposition. We see a breakdown of dialogue. Uh, these uh, these kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, crises in the democratic system would have been unthinkable for a Bajpai. He was uh, someone who believed in reconciliation. He believed in consensus. He believed in dialogue. He believed in reaching out to the opposition. Uh, he believed above all in um, the uh, the politics of universal, what I call the politics of universal friendship. In fact, when Rajiv Gandhi came to power uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in 1984 with over 400 seats, Vajpayee had cautioned him at that time that you have this huge mandate, but no one party can govern India. To govern India, you must achieve reconciliation. You must go in for consensus. You must have a dialogue with the opposition. Uh, to to uh, understand the story of Vajpayee, we also have to understand the story of India's parliament. Uh, Vajpayee's era was the golden age of India's parliament. The 1950s and 1960s was a time when parliament was at the very center of India. And honestly, you know, for me to uh, research this book is to also look at the and read the parliamentary speeches of those times, you know, the 1950s and 1960s, what speeches there were. I mean, the arguments, the scholarly uh, interventions, the jokes, the witticisms, as well as the very, very substantive contributions on all aspects of life, whether it's economy, foreign policy, society, on every issue, every parliamentarian has made speeches that can actually uh, be a whole book in itself. And Bajpai was uh, no less. He was an extremely erudite speaker. Uh, he was a knowledgeable, substantive parliamentarian. And you know, what is not often um, known about Bajpai is that he was a very hardworking parliamentarian. He worked extremely hard at his speeches, at his arguments, um, at creating, uh, a, a, you know, a, a theoretical as well as a political intervention in his arguments. You know, he had this wonderful speech called uh, the Yogi and the Commissar, and uh, in which he spoke about society and state power. The yogi represented by society and commissar represented by state power. And uh, he had this exposition where he said, what will India choose, yogi or state power? And he went into this explanation of why uh, India cannot have an overwhelmingly powerful state, but at the same time, why uh, individuals also have a sense of uh, duty to their community. So uh, I would say that uh, Vajpayee's story is the story of India's parliament. Remember, he was in parliament, not just for 10 years, not for 20 years, not for 30 years, not for 40 years, but for almost 50 years. He was almost, he was almost for, fifth, for half a century, Vajpayee was in parliament. Uh, and he was in parliament as an opposition member 
And as someone who led a very small party uh, who, against a towering uh, Congress at that time led by Jawaharlal Nehru and Indira Gandhi. You remember the Nehru-led Congress never won less than 300 seats. It was always above 300 seats. Uh, the Congress came down in the elections of 1967 to uh, over 200 seats. But then again in 1971, Indira Gandhi came in with a massive majority of over 300 seats. So Bajpai was the quintessential opposition man, always in parliament, always working as an opposition politician in parliament. And I think that is a big difference say, with today's prime minister, who only has been in parliament for the last eight years. I think Modi became a parliamentarian only in 2014. Bajpai was a parliamentarian all his life. So the uh, norms of parliament, the rules of parliament, the uh, procedures of parliament, this was very, very central to Vajpayee. And he had a wonderful phrase, which I'll say in Hindi, uh, he, you know, where, where he would say that in parliament, Maryada me rehkar, simao ke bhitar. You know, within the limits of democracy. And he used to always say that, that to work as a politician in democracy, we need to understand the limits, the limits of power, uh, the limits of uh, executive power, uh, the culture of restraint and the culture of it respecting the opposition. He would say that parliament is the home of the opposition. Parliament is where the opposition functions. Remember, in, in, in parliamentary democracy, uh, the opposition has no executive role. Uh, in parliamentary democracy, the opposition exists only in parliament on the floor of the house. So he would say that this is where the, uh, the opposition lives and breathes and the opposition can call the government into question. So Vajpayee never had access to the instruments of state power. He was always operating within parliament and he was the first to say that it was Nehruvian parliamentary democracy that made possible the emergence of Nehru's greatest opponents because um, it was that parliamentary democracy which, uh, which uh, made possible uh, the, uh, the emergence of Vajpayee and gave him that platform. Of course, he had a very funny story. I mean, the great, you know, the other great discovery for me when in writing this book is just how funny he was. You know, he, Vajpayee had a fund of jokes and wisecracks and, uh, and all kinds of funny uh, uh, wisecracks he would make, which in a way sort of created the, the, the atmosphere for his politics. Because, um, you know, when you share a joke together, when you share laughter together, then you do create this politics of consensus and the politics of what I call universal friendship. And he used humor and he used laughter to great effect. Uh, as you know, uh, there was this famous exchange between Vajpayee and Jawaharlal Nehru, where uh, uh, Vajpayee said that, I know that the prime minister does the shirshasana every morning. You know, Nehru used to do the headstand. I know that uh, the prime minister does the shirshasana every morning, but does that mean he should see my party upside down? You know, so uh, he used to say that he had uh, some tremendously funny jokes about uh, Yashwant Rao Chavan. He would say that in Nehru's time, uh, Mr. Chavan would, of course, wear the, uh, wear the Sherwani and, and Churidar. Then when Shastri came in, Mr. Chavan started wearing the Dhoti. Now that uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi is Prime Minister, what is Mr. Chavan going to wear? You know, so uh, there, were these, uh, there were these tremendous uh, 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 jokes that, uh, <coughs> he would say in Parliament. Um, uh, and and at, at one point, uh, you know, when he was Foreign Minister of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, Janta, of the Janta government, uh, Basant Sate said, well, Mr. Vajpayee, you don't make any foreign policy. If all the foreign policy is made by Mr. Morarji Desai, then it's written down by Mr. Jagat Mehta, who was then the Foreign Secretary. And you only translated into Hindi. So uh, Bajpai turned around and said, well, what can I do if Mr. Basan Sari doesn't understand my English? So now <laughs> I'm going to speak only in Hindi. Uh, and, uh, then, uh, then, you know, on Manmohan Singh, he had this hilarious joke saying that, you know, Manmohan Singh has uh, initiated this policy of, uh, of uh, uh, liberalization. But when are the benefits of liberalization going to reach the poor? I think they will only reach when, you know, he quoted as Ghalib Shair, when our zulf has grown so long that we can, uh, you can, you know, we'll have long, long zulf. 
And this was a, 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 a reference to Manmohan Singh, of course, who was a Sardar and who had his, uh, his long zulf. So, uh, so he had all, you know, it was, it was really hilarious, but he always got, uh, got his, his, his point across. Um, I think the thing to remember also about Bajpai is that uh, when he founded the BJP in 1980, uh, he founded it as a party of Gandhian socialism. Gandhian socialist was the uh, motto that um, Bajpai had uh, had in fact uh, identified the BJP with, and uh, it, it, and he wanted the BJP at that time to be um, centrist, to be pluralist to be open to all sections of society. Uh, as you know, MC Chagla had uh, graced the Mumbai Mahadivation that uh, uh, the BJP had had in 1980 and said that, uh, you know, Bajpai is the man who, um, who uh, uh, India awaits. In fact, he was, he was going to be the, the, you know, Chagla actually hailed Bajpai as a future prime minister. And uh, it was a very open, inclusive, consensual BJP. Uh, that Bajpai had uh, wanted to build in 1980. Now, what is the reason for this? Bajpai was always in the RSS. You know, he joined the RSS against his father's wishes. Uh, Pandit Krishna Bihari Bajpai uh, was a uh, poet and he was a literateur, but he was the inspector general of schools in the Gwalior state and he was very loyal to the Gwalior state. And the Gwalior state, as you know, was loyal to the British Raj. So he didn't approve of Bajpai joining the RSS and joining Andolans and getting involved in the freedom movement. But in spite of his father's opposition, he joined the RSS. He was immediately noticed because he was a brilliant speaker and a brilliant orator and he could uh, have, you know, he could speak the most brilliant poetry and write the most brilliant poetry. And he rose very quickly up the RSS ranks and became Goldworker's favorite. But then entered in his life someone who had a seminal influence on Vajpayee and this influence is often not written about as much as it should be and which I discovered is that the influence of Shama Prasad Mukherjee on Atal Bihari Vajpayee was significant and Shama Prasad Mukherjee uh, is a very interesting character. He was in the Hindu Mahasabha but he was a bar barrister at law. He was you know in England educated. He was the youngest vice chancellor of Calcutta University. He was in Nehru's cabinet and Shama Prasad Mukherjee was a brilliant speaker. He was an exceptionally uh, you know, erudite speaker in parliament. He was absolutely outstanding. And his aim, Shama Prasad Mukherjee's aim, always was to create the political opposition to Nehru, to create a political opposition to the Congress and create the political national alternative to the Congress. Shama Prasad Mukherjee was not part of an RSS um, ideological battle. He was certainly ideologically opposed to Nehru, but his was primarily political. And Vajpayee came into the Janasang. As you know, Golwalkar loaned some RSS Swayam Sevaks to uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee to set up the Janasang. And Vajpayee functioned as Shama Prasad Mukherjee's secretary and he learned a lot from Shama Prasad Mukherjee. And I think from those years was born Vajpayee's fascination with politics. He was ultimately a politician. He was not part of the RSS cultural, what he called cultural social activities, which should operate in the cultural realm. For Vajpayee, he was the politician working with the aim of creating a national alternative to the Congress, a politician who was elected. And he used to keep saying this all his life. I am elected. I have been elected. I have, people have voted for me. And because they have voted for me, my loyalty is to parliament. My loyalty is to the constitution of India. So while remaining moored in the RSS as his, ideolo as his ideological parent, he remained ultimately a politician. And Vajpayee shows us that you can hold very strongly to an ideology, yet listen to others. You can believe in something very strongly, yet be a proponent of pluralism. And that is because he imbibed very strongly Shama Prasad Mukherjee as well as Jawaharlal Nehru's commitment to parliament and commitment to politics. You know, I think this is why a lot of people in the sense get confused as to how an RSS member could also be the kind of uh, prime minister that he was. 
but he could do that because ultimately he defined himself as a politician opposing the Congress, not as a cultural warrior or as a, uh, a, an ideological uh, demagogue or in, in, in any way an ideological warrior. His, he was rooted in, in, in the political sphere. So in 1980, when he set up the BJP as Gandhian socialist, it was basically this political Vajpayee who had, who had who flowered in 1980 and he was an impressive man in 1980 you know he was charming he was resolute he was very handsome he was uh, he was he had a very uh, he had a very hopeful vision of the bjp at that stage as a kind of uh, newly christened janasang but sadly for vajpayee and i think sadly for um, for india the gandhian socialist uh, bjp of vajpayee could not win elections because rising at the same time as um, the Gandhian socialist BJP of Vajpayee was the populist Indira Gandhi and she was unleashing these gusts of populism and personality cult which this moderate centrist uh, you know socialist pluralist Vajpayee could not combat he could not um, uh, confront he could not defeat this Indira Gandhi led Congress so in 19 81 uh you know but uh, these uh, bjp lost uh, assembly elections in 1983 there were very serious uh, bjp lost very seriously in andhra pradesh and karnataka very serious setbacks in 1983 they lost uh, the jammu and kashmir election where the bjp got zero uh, in fact in jammu and kashmir and the hindu vote deserted the bjp uh, in jammu which was a particularly demoralizing setback and then in 1984, of course, the woman he could never defeat uh, in her life almost extinguished his political career with her death. Because in 1984, when Indira Gandhi was assassinated, the Congress came in with 400 seats. Rajiv Gandhi won that big victory. Vajpayee's party was annihilated. Uh, Vajpayee himself lost uh, from, uh, from Gwalior and the BJP came down to two seats. And that, in a sense, was the end of Gandhian socialist BJP because at that time the Sangh Parivar said well enough of this Vajpayee you know moderate pluralism centrism Gandhian socialist we are now going to go for what is our core belief which is ideology so it was a very defeated Vajpayee who in 1986 uh, relinquished the presidency of the BJP and it went to Advani who took the BJP uh, into the Ram Janmabhoomi movement and Vajpayee never again became uh, the president uh, of the BJP. Uh, you know, and here's another contrast with today's times. In today's times, we see in the Congress, we have this, you know, what I call the defeat proof leaders. You know, they get, they, they, they are defeated time and time again, but they never step down or they never uh, relinquish their presidencies. But Vajpayee kept having to resign. Uh, you know, when he uh, became president of the Janasang in 1968 and the Janasang lost in 1971, he had to resign in 1972 as president. Then again, when the, the, the BJP lost in 1984 and he had to resign in 1986 uh, as, uh, as uh, president and it, went, and it went to Advani. Then, of course, in 2004, when the BJP was completely uh, defeated by the Congress, Vajpayee's Bajpai, uh, political career came to an end. So I think that um, he was someone who believed very strongly in the party. He believed very strongly in uh, what he called Panchoki Rai, you know, the, 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 the collective will. Uh, and in that sense, uh, he was quintessentially a party builder and a quintessentially someone who believed in pluralism. It is a tragedy that Vajpayee's version of pluralist secular secular you know pluralist centrism because he believed that if india needed to be governed it could only be governed from the center and it's a tragedy that vajpayee's um centrism could not win elections uh you know vajpayee himself could never win uh more than 182 seats there was a actually a jinx on that and uh he almost like a jinx and he could never win more than 182 seats and if Vajpayee had won in 2004, I believe the Vajpayee line, that is the um, pluralist, centrist, liberalizing, uh, you know, inclusive line that he represented, um, 
would have been dominant and i think india would have been a very different place you know in it would have been a, in a in a very different place very quickly before i end i just want to say a few words about uh bajpai's tenure as prime minister uh, i think as prime minister i think what stands out for me above all is that here was a prime minister who was um came from the rss who was a hindu uh, who was a hindu nationalist by conviction but through his tenure bajpai kept reaching out to pakistan he went to pakistan in a bus in 1999 earlier in 1977 as foreign minister he had gone to pakistan on a goodwill mission he went to uh, he invited musharraf for the agra summit he went again in 2004 for the islamabad summit he um, journeyed to kashmir and in chased urdu at the sher e kashmir stadium he spoke about insaniyat jamhuriyat kashmiriyat so he kept reaching out to pakistan and, and, and you know this is something that um, i think is a model for uh, for prime ministers that he kept building on peace with his neighbors he kept wanting to reach out to uh, the minorities of india he wanted to build bridges with kashmir somebody had asked me that you know today bajpai had got 300 plus seats could he have also similarly uh, done away with uh, you know in, in the manner done away with article 370 yeah. Yes, Vajpai didn't believe in Article 370. He wanted Article 370 to go, but his his way of dealing with it was dhire dhire his jayega. You know, it's called dhire dhire his ne do. So I think he was someone who again believed in the art of consensus and believed in the art of um, you know people to people contact. Uh, I think on the economy, Vajpai's success was dazzling, and Dr. Kilkar will know, of course, that he was inaugurated the era of disinvestment and of privatization and of uh, you know overhauling the telecom sector, and we can you know list all his economic achievements. On national security, Vajpai stumbled a little bit. Um, he was uh, he uh, you know the ICH one four or Operation Parakram or uh, you know the Kargil War saw Vajpai a little bit on the back foot. This is because I say. that the kind of government that he led which was a government which was very delegating autonomy giving bajpai was a supremo in the party but he didn't act like a supremo you know he had very strong ministers i mean just one saying yashwant sinha murli manohar joshi joshi arun shuri these were all very very strong ministers and he gave them their head and he gave them autonomy but this kind of autonomy giving delegating style that he had did not work very well uh in the economy uh, and uh, in the in the national security it worked very well in the economy didn't work very well in national security because there the government uh, was seen to be fumbling but he he, he had a tremendous uh, goodwill in his government the bajpai pmo was full of fun actually uh, i used to cover his holy parties where he used to you know yashwan sinha would come with a manjira and a tholak and he would play the tholak and make bajpai dance and there was one really funny occasion where uh, yashwan sinha dragged uh, bajpai onto the dance floor and uh, made bajpai dance and uh, you know the tholaks were playing in bajpai you know as you know had very bad knees he had uh, arthritis in his knees and after dancing valiantly he sat down tiredly after that he told us ab to operation karana hi padega you know because he had to go going <laughs> for an operation uh, of his knees but he was always really funny about himself and um, uh, you know uh, uh, and um, uh, he he had lots of jokes about himself i'll leave you with the last really funny anecdote uh, which also reveals uh, bajpai's strong links with uh, rajiv gandhi in the congress in 1988 bajpai was diagnosed with a kidney ailment and uh, rajiv gandhi who was prime minister at the time sent bajpai abroad to united to america to, as part of the un delegation to uh, have his um, have his ailment looked at his kidney ailment looked at and when he arrived in america the, it was found that he had some other very serious problem it was cancer or you know some other uh, it was in fact cancer and he had this he ha he was diagnosed with this and so bajpai was at that stage wrote a poem mot se than gayi where he wrote about you know confronting death and this poem came back to india was circulated among all the sang parivar and they all thought so read this poem and said my god mot se than gayi does this mean that you know bajpai is 
is uh, on the, the verge of death. What, what does this poem mean? And uh, it then turned out that actually the ailment was not, it was not very serious. It was actually a very mild malignancy, which was easily cured. And he was in fact cured of it. And he came back to India. And when he came back to India, he landed at Palam Airport and he found the cro uh, crowds and crowds of, uh, you know, his Sang Parivar and party workers had uh, come to see him, come to meet him. And his aide, Shivakumar, was there at that time. And Shivakumar told me the story. I interviewed him. Uh, Shivakumar told him, Dekhye, sir, kitne log hai? Thousands of people have come just to see you land at Palam Airport. And so Vajpayee turned around to Shivakumar and said, Ye soch rahe hai ki abhi to maut ka dastavez likkar bheja tha, ab zinda kaise lot raya. Also, that was a kind of funny uh, jokes he would make about himself. His, his life was full of really of jokes and, and love of good food, love of good drink. Uh, uh, he, uh, he also, you know, had tremendous uh, love for the company of artists and, you know, uh, poets. Uh, so all in all, I would say a pursuer of consensus the quintessential politician, uh, the quintessential uh, builder of reconciliation, a believer that if India had to be governed well, it had to be governed from the center, and at the same time, a very colorful Zindadil character. So I think the loss of Vajpayee, as, as I said, uh, is deeply felt by all of us at this time. I wish he was here today. I wish Vajpayeeism was still alive today. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sagarika. Now let me invite uh, uh, Rajdeep uh, to give his uh, uh, remarks, and then I will invite Dr. Mashanka. Rajdeep, you have the floor. Okay, I, I'll do what I can do, which is question and answer. So I'll ask the questions, and uh, Sagarika can give the answers. It's an unusual role that I've been put in. Uh, where I have to uh, ask questions of someone who has been part of my life for so many years in a very different <laughs> outcome. But I will try. It's a, it's a new experience and since we are, um, you know, uh, privileged to be here at uh, Pune International Center. So, first of all, happy Gudi Padwa, Ugadi, Navre and all the festivals and of course the holy month of Ramzan also starting. So, it's a very auspicious day. But let me use that as an analogy that, you know, on a day when Ramzan and Guri Padwa are falling on the same day, there will be those who will say that this, this is an idea of India, of a pluralistic idea you, of, of India that we should celebrate. You kept mentioning the word pluralism, but there will be critics of Vajpayee who will say that when he was tested on pluralism, he failed. You say uh, among your choices, he was a liberal statesman, but also a Hindutva icon. So let's reconcile that, whether it was the Babri Masjid demolition in 1992, whether it's Vajpayee's speeches on Nelly, whether it is his speech in Bhivandi, or indeed his stand that eventually he took on Gujarat, where he sort of backed down from any confrontation with uh, Mr. Modi and Mr. Advani. How do you see that? Did Vajpayee fail this test of real pluralism or democracy? And therefore, are you looking at a more sympathetic version, which liberals today will say is a flawed way of looking at Atal Bihari Vajpayee. You are normalizing, according to them, someone who they see firmly in the Hindutva camp who failed the test of democracy, no, of liberal I, democracy. No, I think that's a very good question. And I think that a biography is not a hagiography. You know, I've not written a hagiography of Vajpayee, uh, simply praising him for uh, the things that he did. What I have done is taken him to task for what he didn't do but also looked at what he did do. And yes, there are several occasions where Vajpayee failed the test of constitutional democracy. He failed the test of constitutional democracy, for example, in his famous speech of 1970, where he said, Hindu which, was a, uh, uh, which was a kind of a uh, very provocative speech. And he said it in parliament in 1992, before the demolition of the Babri Masjid, he said, Ab bedi to banegi, when he spoke about the leveling of the ground. Uh, and it's certainly in Gujarat, uh, when he failed to dismiss the government of Narendra Modi and of course the speech that you mentioned in Nelly. But I think to look at Vajpayee, you know, we have to look at chronology, you know, as Amit Shah says, chronology samjhiye. You know, uh, I think if we look at it chronologically, 
Now, why did Vajpayee not act against the Gujarat government in 2002? I mean, I asked myself this question many times and I struggled to answer the question. Uh, Vajpayee was convinced that in 2002, he had to dismiss the Narendra Modi government. He, he was convinced that Modi on his own had, should resign as, as Gujarat chief minister. He was convinced about this. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest this. He said this to Advani, he said it to Shuri, he said it to uh, just one saying, all of whom have recorded how passionately Vajpayee wanted Modi to resign. Now, the reason why he was not able to enforce his will is because his party didn't want to want to let Modi go. And above all, L.K. Advani, who was his close political, you know, who, who, was, who Vajpayee relied on for uh, political organization, was firmly dug in that Narendra Modi should not resign. And it's a very interesting um, scenario that I have sketched in, in, in the book where, uh, you know, where at the, at the BJP National Executive that took place in 2002 in Goa, and in that hotel room where uh, the de de deliberations were being held on whether Modi should resign or not, where groups of people stood up in that, in that hall and said, no, no, istifa mat do, istifa mat do, istifa mat do. Now, Vajpayee, you know, above all, and this is what he also has in common with Nehru, he would not ever go against his party. You know, whatever his party wanted, that was what he would he would follow. Pancho ki rai, he would go with the collective will of the party. So when, even though his own conviction was that he uh, wanted to uh, dismiss the Modi government, if the party didn't want it, he would not impose his view. And, and you know, let me tell you one thing, which is why chronologically, uh, if, we, if we look at it, you see, 2002 was two years before 2004. Elections were ahead in 2004. And in 2002, there was no opposition to Mr. Vajpayee. It was Mr. Vajpayee all, 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 all around, Vajpayee dominant. This was a dominant Vajpayee. Sonia Gandhi and the Congress posed no uh, competition to Vajpayee. So he probably thought, and this is what I... You know, I write my uh, biographies uh, late at night at dawn. And sometimes, you know, I try and sort of communicate with the person as if the spirit of Vajpayee or the spirit of Indira Gandhi is kind of communicating with me. And one of the, one of the, uh, one of the things that I, I thought that Vajpayee may have felt was that, you see, in 2002, he could not have known that he would be defeated in 2004. He could not have known that uh, Congress would win in 2004. I mean, we remember the election of 2004, right? We in the media were surprised that the Congress actually won that election. Everybody was thinking that it was a foregone conclusion that the uh, that the Congress would be defeated and Vajpayee would win. So perhaps he thought that in 2004, if he came back to power and he was came back as an established leader, then he would perhaps act against the extremist sections uh, of his party and act against the extremist sections of his, uh, 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 you know, of, of the Sangh Parivar, which he had taken care all through his tenure to keep at bay. You know, the one, um, uh, the one uh, 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 interaction I had with Namita Bhattacharya, Vajpayee's daughter, was when I asked her about this, about uh, Vajpayee and the RSS, and she said he, he kept them like that. He kept them, you know, like that at bay. So he, throughout Vajpayee's tenure in government, he was being attacked not only by the RSS, but by the uh, Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh, by the Swadeshi Jagran Manch, by the Vishwa Hindu Parishad. Parisha. They were at Vajpayee's throat. So he probably thought that in 2004, if he came back to power, he would be in a stronger position. And that's my reading of why perhaps he soft pedaled in 2002. But to say that, that he failed the test of constitutional democracy completely is not true because there are moments when he failed, there are moments when he passed. You know, but the other view would be that he was therefore a survivor, a political survivor who was ready to compromise morally for survival. Whether in the late 80s he saw the rise of Advani ji and the movement towards Ram Janmabhoomi, then he quickly kept Gandhian socialism aside and went with he the flow. He, he, he went with the flow of uh, of uh, Advani ji and, and, and the Ram Janmabhoomi movement. Uh, even though he was himself uh, sort of being marginalized at the time, he sort of recognized that, you know, I need to be patient and wait my time. Again, then when it comes to uh, 2002, as you now suggest that he was happy to sort of go with the flow as long as he won the elections of 2004. The belief is therefore that he was a moral compromiser, that he yeah. was not someone who sort of stood firmly for any conviction apart from himself. 
he was determined and, and tragically some would say that he should have been prime minister maybe in the late 70s when Moranji became because he was then 55 see, you know he was a much younger Vajpayee by the time he becomes prime minister he's in his late 70s do you sense that he is a political survivor above all else that and therefore that also reveals the limitations of Vajpayee the individual yes he's a political survivor he's a political careerist I believe Vajpayee was a very uh, ruthless uh, uh, a politician and an ambitious political career as both Indira Gandhi and Vajpayee were. I mean, you can't get to prime ministership unless you are a ruthless politician. You know, neither of these two people are just very nice, happy, cuddly people. I mean, they are, uh, you know, they are, they are, they are um, ruthless politicians. They are, they are very clever politicians and they have a sense of manifest destiny. You I mean, know, he even outpunned you were uh, Advani ji. You know, yes. at the end of the day, Advani yes. ji was the one who built one would say the BJP, yes. particularly in the 1990s. He had outmaneuvered Advani ji. He, Vajpayee has outmaneuvered all his rivals. He outmaneuvered Balraj Madhok in the 1950s, where he very cleverly painted Balraj Madhok into a kind of uh, right wing, uh, in, in fact, in the 1960s, where he uh, cleverly outmaneuvered Balraj Madhok and pushed him into a marginalized corner. And by the time it came to 1972, and uh, 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 Advani was uh, party president, Balraj Madhok was expelled. He outmaneuvered Govinda Charya. Subramaniam Swami. Out Subramaniam Swami also uh, after the emergency. He outmaneuvered Govinda Charya, who in 1997 called him a Mukhota. Once Govinda Charya had called him a Mukhota, it was time up for Govinda Charya. Govinda Charya soon found himself walking out of the exit door. He outmaneuvered Kalyan Singh, uh, who was the uh, strongman in, um, in in UP, and he was the you know the backward caste strongman in UP. And and Vajpayee was never comfortable with the mundalization of the BJP. He was very much a upper caste Brahminical uh, elite politician in that sense. And anyway, Kalyan Singh fell foul of um, Vajpayee, as you know, he called him a retired leader led by retired bureaucrats. Uh, Kalyan Singh was openly uh, very uh, critical of Vajpayee and. Kalyan Singh found himself expelled out of the exit door. Uh, the, the only failure that Vajpayee had was Modi. I mean, if, if, if Vajpayee had his way, he would have actually, Modi would have met the same fate as Balraj Madhok, as Kalyan Singh, as Govinda Charya, as uh, Adwani. Uh, he was that kind of a, a power player. And they both were, both Indira Gandhi and Vajpayee were, you know. If there's a common trend between these two characters who I've uh, investigated. It is this belief in themselves that, you know, people who are destined to stamp their presence in history, I think, have this belief in myself and manifest destiny that I am who I am. I'm special. There's a reason why doors are opening for me. There's a reason why people are applauding me. Ne Indira Gandhi thought I was uh, Nehru's daughter. I'm Indira, India's princess. I would be prime minister. Vajpayee thought. I am, I am Vajpayee. I am Goldwalker's favorite. I am the politician who is uh, hailed by everybody. I am the supreme. Remember, he was a star at the age of 33. By the time he came to parliament, he was already a superstar. He was um, uh, the, 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 spoken of as a prime minister since, you know, since the mid, uh, almost since the mid 1960s in, in, in the Janasang. And he, and if Vajpayee believed in anything very strongly, whether it was the parliamentary democracy or constitution or Hindutva, if there's anything he believed in very strongly, it was Vajpayee. <laughs> okay. Vajpayee believed very strongly in Vajpayee. One final question before we open it up is uh, the interesting aspect of his personal life. Now, normally the private lives of politicians are not discussed, but you've explored it uh, in this book. And the fact that, you know, fascinatingly, he had this relationship uh, with a married woman. Uh, I mean, in most other parts of the world, that would be the end of your political career. But Vajpayee was able to carry out the consensus that he built in politics, also in his private life. What explains that? that you know, do you see that, therefore, as, again, more evidence of the kind of person he was, who was, at the end of the day, a believer in, uh, uh, in keeping his private life far away from his public persona? Yeah, that's a that's that's a big big question about Vajpayee actually, and I've dealt with that in chapter ten. I wanted to actually put it in chapter one. I start the book with that, but my publishers said no, people will get confused. But I do think that you know his private life, as you very rightly say, is key to him. You know, he lived all his life uh, with a married woman who who he, who he had fallen in love with in college. He lived with her, her husband, and 
her two children as part of a very happy family. They were a menage a trois. And I know when I was writing this book, this aspect fascinated Rajdeep the most. He kept saying, oh, menage a trois, menage a trois. And, you know, so in fact, they were a very um, harmonious uh, threesome. And, uh, you know, Appa Ghatate, who was my great source for the book, and it's a great, uh, you know, it's a great heartbreak for me that Appa is not here. He passed away um, in January, uh, that he's not here to, uh, to see this book because uh, Appa actually was fundamental in this book. And he you, used to tell me that when he invited Vajpayee over for dinner, Mrs. Call would come with Vajpayee and her husband. And the, and the three of them would be, you know, very happy together. And she, in fact, gave an interview to a woman's magazine saying that the reason why she respected her husband so much was because her husband actually accepted the relationship that, um, that, uh, he, that she and Vajpayee shared. And I think that, you know, when someone is having this kind of a relationship publicly, out in the open, he never flaunted it, but he never hid it. It was never hidden that Vajpayee was living with Mrs. Call, who was married, and uh, married to Mr. Call, and he lived with them. And so I think when some someone is having this kind of a relationship all his life, it says something about them, right? It says that they are unconventional, iconoclastic, even bohemian people. And I, and I think this strain of irreverence and iconoclasm and rebellion stayed with Vajpayee all his life. He rebelled against his father by joining the RSS. He rebelled against the RSS, against the orthodoxies of the RSS. He rebelled against the shibboleths of Nehruvian social, socialism and secularism. He rebelled against uh, any kind of rigidities of the Sangh Parivar. He rebelled against any kind of diktat on his personal life. He rebelled against uh, any kind of set um, format of what a BJP politician should be, that you should be vegetarian or you should not have alcohol or you should, uh, you know, you should shun the company of, of, of you know, beautiful you know, ladies, he rebelled against all these stereotypes expected of him. So I think he was quite rebellious. He was quite iconoclastic. And I think this is in tune with the generation of the 1930s and 1940s who plunged into Andolan. You know, when you, when you get into a political movement, maybe the middle class uh, conventions of marriage and two children and all that go out of the window. I mean, whether you had Mahatma Gandhi and his open experiments with uh, celibacy, whether you had Jawala Nehru's relationship, the Ramanur Luya, for example, who lived all his life with the, uh, you know, with Rama Mitra, who he actually never married. So that, that, that generation was, you know, in a sense, rebellious. Their whole life was given to the Andolan. They whole, or the whole life was given to the movement. And I think Bajpai was equally rebellious and equally, um, equally so when he was asked actually at one press conference i, I must uh, share this at a best press conference when he was uh, a foreign minister he uh, a journalist actually stood up and asked he was talking about you know pakistan and china and border disputes and a journalist stood up and asked bajpai ji chori hai ye pakistan or china or ye sab ke bare mein mrs call kon hai mrs call ke bare mein bataiye and so bajpai thought for a while and said kashmir jaisa mamla hai you know so so he was uh, he was very open to uh, he was very open to uh, to this kind of uh, uh, talk about his own private life and he often said इंडिविजुअल Uh, and yet, because he's traversed such a long period of India's post-independence uh, era, that uh, on the back of Indira Gandhi, I think Vajpayee is an interesting figure to explore. And uh, so, uh, thank you. You know, I, I would say that that if the comparison is made between Indira Gandhi and Vajpayee, I think uh, Indira Gandhi perhaps is the more uh, the, she's the personality cult, but Vajpayee is more of a democrat. You know, uh, paradoxically, he's a more of a democratic. He had his functioning is more democratic. So how would Indira how would but okay? Let me leave you with the last and keep a short answer. How would Narendra Modi or, or this regime have dealt with Bajpai? How would Bajpai have fitted in? Would he have been firmly in the Mark Darshak Mandal? Would he have approved of particularly the way Parliament functions today? 
I think Bajpai would have been a complete misfit today. I think he would have been horrified at the manner in which parliament is being uh, degraded. I think he would have had a lot of problems with uh, the power of uh, money power in elections. Remember in Bajpai's time in 1999, his government fell by one vote in parliament. Imagine a government falling by one vote. I mean, today that, that seems unthinkable. Uh, Bajpai was a creature entirely of parliament. Uh, I think he would be very much at sea at Twitter and um, Facebook. I, I don't think Bajpai would have been able to compose a tweet. You know, I, I remember you telling me the story actually when Bajpai was uh, giving speeches, there would be these long pauses and television journalists would be wondering what to do in those pauses. Should we go to commercial break? Should we go to <laughs> some other program because for 10 minutes Vajpayee was pausing between one line and another line. So uh, I think he, he was a uh he was very much a, 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 you know, he was very much a creature of, 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 uh, of a consensus. So I think today he would have been horrified at the manner in which, for example, parliament was bypassed for, say, CAA and uh, 370. Mind you, the citizenship law was actually brought in in 2003 by the Vajpayee government, although that, of course, was designed towards Ill illegal immigrants and not particular towards any one particular community as such. But Vajpayee uh, uh, was, was, again, he, uh, he, you know, in Vajpayee's time, laws were debated, not just for hours, not just for days, but for weeks. And his bureaucrats, I, and I had the opportunity to speak to Shakti Sinha, who sadly also is no longer there. Uh, Shakti Sinha told me the problem with Vajpayee's uh, bureaucrats was that he's not uh, taking care of government because he's just sitting in parliament all the time. So he was he was rooted in parliament. I think he would have been horrified at the manner in which parliament is being uh, dismissed, at the way opposition is being not consulted on issues, uh, at the way you know free speech is being uh, uh, sort of uh, you know in many ways muzzled. I uh, remember Vajpayee's close associate was uh, George Fernandez, who was himself a, a socialist, a former trade unionist. He was convener of the NDA. Uh, his close associate was um, a British Mishra, who was uh, the son of D.P. Mishra, who was, a, in fact, a Congress, uh, uh, you know, politician. Uh, he, his close associate was Just One Singh. So neither British Mishra nor Just One Singh nor George Fernandez had any links with the RSS. Uh, Vajpayee's uh, way of governing, uh, I think he would have uh, been very horrified at the notion of the, uh, a kind of super PMO. I think Vajpayee was very much into consulting his minister. So I think today Vajpayee would certainly be in the Mark Dashar Mandal along with uh, L.K. Advani. Uh, you know, we had two bureaucrats who worked or, or two uh, uh, formidable people who worked with Vajpayee at various times, Dr. Mashirka and Dr. Kirkar. Before I hand it over back to you, I just remember the last time I interviewed Vajpayee Ji was April of 2004, a month before the election and a day after that, horrifying sari episode happened in Lucknow where there was a stampede and women died looking for saris. And that day he admitted, when I asked him, sir, where is India shining? And he admitted, and it almost seemed that that day he knew that the shining India, India shining campaign was the wrong one for India at the time. He virtually said this in an interview that is there in, on a, in the NDTV archives. And I had also asked him about politics and he said, yeah, politics, mujhe. he was uncomfortable with the politics of money. I think he had grown in the 1950s. He had joined out of ideological conviction. And I think he was increasingly finding himself isolated by the money power that he saw around him. And therefore, I also would tend to agree that he would have been extremely discomforted with the politics that we see around us, uh, where M MLAs and MPs can be bought and sold. Uh, that's not uh, the politics and or the age that, that Atal Bihari Vajpayee belong to either way contentious uh, figure uh, was he the right man uh, uh, or the right man in the wrong party or was he as he simply said a swayam sevak all his life and therefore uh, built the bjp we can endlessly debate that but back to you uh, dr kelkar and dr mashilkar and thank you once again thank you uh, now we will have a brief q and a session uh, i'll request uh, uh, abhay to read out the questions for sagarika and then she can respond Yes, sir. thank you, Dr. Kelkar. Uh, thank you, Rajdeep and uh, Chagarika. You indeed present all sides of Mr. Vajpayee, which is what a good biography is about and which is what a good biographer does. Uh, I would like to begin with the first question. I, um, one of the most uh, tragic episodes of Indian history was the exodus of Kashmiri Pandits. Uh, one would even say ethnic cleansing from the valley in 
Now, where was uh, Mr. Vajpayee then and how did he react to what was happening? Well, that's a very good question, actually, because uh, Vajpayee at that stage, the BJP, as you know, was giving support to the VP Singh government uh, at the center. And uh, the governor of the time was Mr. Jagmohan. Uh, who, of course, went on to become a um, you know leader of the BJP. In 1990, the, the BJP, the Vajpayee Advani-led BJP was, uh, as you know, getting ready for the Rath Yatra, uh, which, was, um, uh, which was started in uh, September 1990 by LK Advani and was supposed to end up in uh, Ayodhya by uh, November 1990 for the, in time for the... Uh, for the Kar Seva in Ayodhya. So I have to say that the exodus of the Kashmiri Pandits, uh, which uh, was taking place at the time, uh, the uh, Vajpayee Advani led BJP uh, was not, in fact, in any, uh, you know, it did not play any significant role at the time. At that time, the politics was very much centered around the Mandal Mandir um, uh, sort of confrontation that was taking place at the central level. VP Singh had just announced the, uh, the, the Mandal Commission report uh, in retaliation for which Advani took out the Rath Yatra. So uh, India was in the throes of Man Mandal and Mandir. Uh, at the time of the exodus of the Kashmiri Pandit. So it has to be said that the Vajpayee Advani-led BJP did not play a very significant role at the time in the uh, either reaching out to the Kashmiri Pandits or uh, ameliorating their grievances or in fact uh, even taking up the cause of the Kashmiri Pandits in any of the party manifestos. Uh, we have this question from uh, Mr. Sushil Bolde. Uh, is there another Vajpayee in the BJP ranks today? Uh, well, uh, you know, that remains to be seen. I think Indian politics always throws up surprises. Uh, and I think that, uh, that uh, you know, there are the, always leaders waiting to emerge. But I would say the crucible of uh, leaders, you know, the place where leaders can emerge uh, is parliament. You know, parliament is the place where you see uh, a politician, where you see the power of his arguments, you see the power of uh, his um, his uh, uh, his speech, where you see the power of his, uh, his, his oratory, his intellect. Today, we have a situation where, you know, there's a kind of disjunction between electability and parliamentary performance. Uh, your parliamentary performance can be wonderful, but you need not get elected because of parliamentary performance. You know, in um, Vajpayee's time, whether it was a Hirendra Nath Mukherjee or whether it was uh, Bhupesh Gupta or Nath Babu Pai or Minu Masani or you know they, they all got elected because of the way they performed in parliament. Today there's a disjunction between parliament and electability. Today Mahua Maitra of the TMC is a wonderful parliamentarian but to win a seat in Bengal she needs the Mamta Banerjee personality cult. So media and social media have created a sort of personality cult driven politics. Um, can I, can where, I just answer where, your question more directly? I would say one very interesting me, Shashi Tharoor, could well be argued right man in the wrong party at the moment. Uh, you know, uh, because he's, you know, he, every time he's seen to reach out to the BJP on a particular issue, his own party goes for him and says, you know, but you're a congressman and he's a fine parliamentarian again. But, uh, you know, is he, a, a, can he sort of win only because he's a parliamentarian? So I think, I think, so I think but, that, but he, but he, but no, but Sashi Thanur has won the three times sure. on his own steam. No, and, but I'm just wondering whether, so, you know, whether, whether, that, you know, he also believes in a sort of consensus building pluralism where let's say the Modi government does something which is to be, uh, which is to be appreciated. He chooses to do so, but gets a backlash from his own party because politics has also become so polarized. But Shashi Tharoor is not the new, can't be the new BJP Vajpayee. Not the BJP, I'm saying if you uh, want to a Vajpayee-like figure, a in terms of the, figure. just looking to bridge the divide. Very few politicians today are genuinely bridge builders. Most of them, you know, Sharad Pawar in his own way was a politician, but he was more a, a sort of negotiator, political negotiator. But, you know, I, uh, what I do appreciate about Mr. Pawar from time to time is that he would like to be seen as a coalition builder. Uh, perhaps, unfortunately, uh, over the years has, you know, uh, he's sort of, you may not call him in the Vajpayee uh, mold, but consensus builder in his own way as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Kelkar, I would like to uh, 
Uh, bring in you and Dr. Marshall Karia. Would you like to share some yeah. memories of yours uh, of uh, Mr. Vajpayee? Uh, well, let me invite Dr. Marshall Karia, who worked with Vajpayee, uh, to make his share his thoughts. Yes. Uh, first of all, Sagarika, this has been an absolutely fascinating hour. So, on behalf of Pune International Center, uh, really uh, want to thank you. Um, I have gone through. The entire book, by the way, from page one to page 372. And as a scientist, what I found fascinating is the following. <laughs> that when we write scientific research papers, we always give references because we all believe in evidence-based analysis and so on. Can you believe it? You have 10% of your book as references. This I have not seen even in uh, a scientific book, by the way. And that is absolutely remarkable. It shows the <laughs> research that you have done. And, um, I mean, the, uh, it's absolutely incredible. The insights that you have, uh, the uh, uh, intimate analysis that you have done to create a portrait is absolutely uh, fabulous. Uh, that's the first part. It is a must-read book. Uh, it is unputdownable. There is no doubt about that at all. And this is your gift to the society, to the nation. So we thank you. Uh, just two quick points, because this has been an inspiring hour. Uh, I'm a scientist, uh, Vijay is an economist, and we both had the fortune to work with uh, Vajpayee. I have a number of memories, but I'll just pick out two. Uh, that was his spontaneity. For example, when, uh, you know, I was the director general of CSR, 40 labs, as you know, and he was the president of CSR. And I remember 2003, we celebrated the Diamond Jubilee, 60 years. And he was the chief guest in Vigyan Bhavan, and we're going to have big facility. And uh, we're wondering what sort of advertisement we should come out with. And as usual, several ideas uh, came up, you know, 60 years, so 60 breakthrough technologies, et cetera, et cetera. I said, nothing doing, a blank paper and a finger. All right, and the election ink on the finger. This is indelible ink, this is democracy, because that ink was created by CSR. National Physical Laboratory. Oh, really? The indelible ink that is... Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Oh, and I therefore, see. it is uh, like CSR technology on billion fingers. You know, that kind of a thing. Oh, really? Tell that. And Sudhin Kulkarni tells me that morning, he had this habit of reading news, like you have even described his uh, uh, Dinacharja, I mean, how you would... Uh, yes. So in the morning, he would uh, read the newspaper. Sudhin Kulkarni tells me, because see what would happen, you know, uh, Sagarika, because it's a blank page and just a finger. So everybody has to look at it. You can't miss it. So he asked uh, uh, Sudhin and Sudhin explained to him what he said, wow, kya baat hai. And then, you know, Sagarika, he was given a written speech in the, uh, to, to be recited in the, uh, in the program. He just set it aside and he talked about democracy and technology. That is absolutely spontaneous, one of the most fascinating speeches I've heard. That is one instance of spontaneity. The second, I will tell you, on 11 May 1998, we had the CSR Directors Conference in Bangalore with 40 labs, and we had launched our small aircraft on that day. In the afternoon, uh, DRDO did the Trishul, the missile. Yes. And in the evening, we have, of course, had Pokhara, Pokhran 2. Yes, yes, yes. So I suggested to Dr. Muli Manozoshi, who was the Minister of Science and Technology, that we should call it a technology day. So he nodded in approval, but then actually what happened, again, spontaneously, in National Physical Laboratory, we had a uh, Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar uh, award ceremony, which he was giving. I was sitting on his side and Dr. Muliman Oshi on the other side. And I just mentioned to him, sir, this has happened on 11 May, et cetera. You might want to uh, consider, et cetera. He didn't respond. And when he started speaking, basically, he just put his papers down finally, and said, we declare 11 May 1998 as technology day for India. Right. Spontaneity, he did not go through any processes. It appealed to him and he said, this has to be done. I will just give these two instances. I have many, many yeah. uh, such instances. He was an icon for me. Yeah. He was a hero for me. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Mashilkar. Uh, Sagarika, I want, I'll join Dr. Mashilkar in thanking you. Absolutely brilliant uh, 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 presentation. My only but my few grouses, my main grouses, you didn't praise him enough because you completely left out the most important contribution, in my view, on economic reforms. Yes, yes. You know, he, unlike, I don't want to minimize the Rao Monmonsing reforms, but they were imposed on India by crisis. 
while uh, Vajpayee ji did it without crisis, it anticipated making Indian economy great. So he was much more forward looking and uh, the consensus based, as you mentioned. So I think from crisis led reforms to consensus led reforms was his innovation, uh, which really gave the foundation of the next golden uh, at the first golden age of growth between 2003 to 2011, when India never uh, increased at the rate of growth. So I think uh, uh, he brought in, for instance, telecom reforms, his highways. These two uh, uh, are the chain in India in terms of his growth and productivity, and especially in rural areas. So I think, uh, uh, and, also, and also, the way he and Arun Shori uh, changed the whole uh, area of privatization, first time they did it. So I think maybe you should give him, should, one should really take him even, even, uh, even higher level in terms of uh, launching India's golden age of growth. And really, whatever happened later on, only because his uh, 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 commitment to reforms. And second point I'm going to make is uh, uh, as personal uh, is his spontaneity as an example. I will give one more example. When I, was, I worked with him twice, once a finance secretary, and other advisor, finance minister. During the uh, budget session, uh, uh, you know, budget is made between finance minister and prime minister. Others are not involved. So one of the meetings we had with the, while getting out, I uh, asked the Prime Minister, sir, can I take a minute or we said, what? He says, uh, we would like to propose, uh, uh, because that was a 400, I think four, fourth century celebration of Dasan to Daneshwar. So I said, there's a poet, Daneshwar, we want to bring out a coin on him, uh, on him because uh, from our mint. He said, of course, in mint, you know, he said, he says, Sanjay Daneshwar, why did we wait so long to bring out a uh, uh, coin on him? And then we brought out the coin, but he was instantaneous reaction, very positive, and uh, very, very sort of uh, uh, supportive of uh, everybody. I mean, he would uh, allow even, you know, on the totem pole, civil servant, the lowest in the uh, there, but he would be very, very sort of, uh, uh, what do you call, polite. And a commitment to the civil servants. And he would encourage. In fact, once in a meeting, somebody was not allowing him to speak. So he intervened prayer and said, So he was very keen. I mean, he was really, as you said, very proper in terms of uh, procedures. He didn't want any short circuits in the procedure. So I think uh, you are short tender him, us, him because he has really done to Indian economy, which uh, in many ways qualities a much, much better contribution. And if, to, if you don't believe me, read Shankar Acharya's uh, autobiography. He also served as a chief advisor for him. And he also brings out uh, probably a bit more data than I would have. Uh, but I think that's an important contribution. We have to acknowledge of uh, uh, Atalji to India and Indian, India's modernization. And whatever we have today, uh, he really laid the foundation for the Indian economy. So uh, I think now we have probably over this, over short the time, I think, isn't it, uh, Abhay? Uh, no, sir. We, we 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 will end at twelve forty-five. So we have. Okay. Uh, so we we'll let, just... let, 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 let me give. Oh, no, sir, give? Actually, you know, I I I've dealt at uh, dealt at length with his economic uh, successes, and I've also written the two thousand and three. You know, the economists had called it an annus mirabilis. That you know, no, instead of an annus horribilis, which uh, you know, as is spoken about, but annus mirabilis because it was a miracle year. I mean, it was a year in which uh, growth almost reached ten percent, and uh, of course, the achievements of uh, uh, of Arun Shori and uh, you know, and Yashwan and I've written in detail about that. But you know, interestingly, sir, I just want to point out the manner in which he managed the political consensus for economic reforms, because um, uh, uh, you know, Yashwan Sinha has said that he was actually publicly attacked by Dattopan Thengadi of the Bharatiya Mazdu Sangh and he was called an Aparadhi. You know, the, 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 the uh, moves to privatize insurance was met with a lot of resistance from the BMS and from the Swadeshi Jagran Manch. And he, um, Yashwan Sinha describes how uh, Vajpayee had a series of uh, lunches with uh, K.S. Sudarshan of the RSS uh, and tried to persuade the RSS to uh, to actually come on board the economic reforms uh, package. And uh, th there's this very interesting uh, uh, anecdote where, uh, you know, Bajpai kept offering Sudarshan some ice cream. 
you know, at the lunch, he would say that, you know, to, to make matters better, let's have ice cream. And he kept offering him ice cream. And Sudarshan said, no, no, no more ice cream because I... <coughs> Ice cream, you know, I ice cream <laughs> at the at the uh, thought of all these privatization <laughs> and moves that Bajpai was making. But uh, you're absolutely right. I think uh, he is really the father of Indian telecom, I, that which I have ca uh, called him, and and actually uh, certainly the uh, creator of the second generation economic reforms. Absolutely so. You know the way he handled the connectivity handled. issue and the way they launched. And on consensus building, he has, even in the area of defense, yeah. you want to get in private <coughs> into, in fact, uh, he and, uh, but mainly George Fernando, Fernando, the defense minister called me, and we almost had to work, work out a blueprint. And then I'm afraid St. Anthony became the defense minister and the uh, whole thing went kaput. And many of our industrial difficulties on strategic sector would have been avoided had we accepted the uh, if you had to, if you had to advise the present government uh, on uh, economic reforms, and if if you had to advise them on how uh, the political consensus of economic reforms can be managed, would you advise the government, uh, the present government, to look at Mr. Vajpayee and to see? Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, it? undoubtedly, he had uh, he has shown the ways of uh, even difficult issues like defense. I mean, can you imagine he was willing to? Get and what what was done that he said uh, and they're done through a former socialist, namely George Fernandez. Yeah. But only thing George Fernandez told me that I must meet the uh, the labor unions. So I met met thrice the labor unions of ordnance factories and defense uh, PSUs. But uh, and then of course he would have handled his own politics. Second instance of his politics was I was also chair this uh, tax reform. There's a lot of criticism by the party on they criticize me. So I was a bit disturbed. So I met and uh, just one thing. There was resistance to you. Yeah, to you. because I was chairing that section. So they were attacking me. Oh. And what I did was with, to create consensus, I have, with this permission, I put draft report on the public net. And for the, so there's a lot of uh, uh, brickbats. But he said he never sort of uh, resigned from it. He created a party. Uh, uh, that time, I think, president was Rajna Singh. So he created a small group within the party and his chairmanship to discuss our reports, met us to meet them, whole party machinery. Uh, and he was working on own level, which I didn't know what it was. He said, don't worry, politics will take care of it. You just focus on that. So he was willing to meet his party. And, and let me tell you, that reduction of tax rates was one of the major foundations of economic reform the next 10 years. And uh, but he handled his party and he handled and of course, it really very well. Rajnath you know, Singh ji is one of the last remaining Bajpai bucks. Yeah. So the earlier question. He's an example of uh, of someone who believes in that old style of Bajpai. Yeah, he did. He did mm -hmm. our report. He was the one. Uh, and uh, uh, I was. I mean, in passing, I must tell you, I mean, it never occurs to us. Uh, I asked Rajnath Singh ji, "What is the most? Why are you so disturbed by our report?" You know, he said, I'll be very honest with you. In elections, most of the elect booths are managed by lower level civil servants. <laughs> and unless, because that's what uh, he says, uh, we cannot annoy them. In uh, uh, So I said, that's not difficult to do it, but uh, we are, our aim was to increase investment in the economy. And I know, I know, I know, but this is our problem is there. He was very frank. He said, all are manned by uh, these lower level functionaries and you're asking that, you know, reduce their exemptions, reduce their uh, uh, other uh, sort of concessions to them. So that was bothering them. So that I said. Like this, this, you know, this, this uh, politics of consensus, Murli Manohar Joshi told me a very interesting story that in 2004, when uh, it came to opening up a dialogue with the Hurriyat, and the Vajpayee uh, government decided to go in for a dialogue with the Hurriyat, you know, which was a which was a very unprecedented thing. I mean, here was a BJP government going into a dialogue with the uh, Kashmiri separatist Hurriyat. And uh, Joshi said that all the cabinet ministers were sitting around, Yashwan Sinha, Joshi, Advani, Jaswan Singh, they were all sitting around. And the idea was ki Hurriyat ke baat karega? Uh, who, who will go into a dialogue with the Hurriyat? And 
Bajpai looked at everybody and he pointed to Advani and said, "Aap baat kare." <laughs> <laughs> so the the the, the Hindu hawk was sent into dialogue with the with the Hurrian, and I think that uh, that in in many exactly. ways. Exactly. So he was tax reformed. He picked yeah. up the president himself to discuss. So he he eliminated yeah. other other criticism because of that. <laughs> and once he got him on board, and we had those reforms. So I think, uh, but he never sort of. Up, you know, uh, uh, criticize me or didn't tell me what to do. He said, "Aap jo kehte hain, wo likhiye, bolie. Don't compromise with that. Right. Take care of the politics part of it. He did his own way. Yes, he took care of the politics part of it completely. Yeah, yeah. So allowing the economy to exactly, and he uh, he really respected the discussion and debate. And yes, as you say, we really miss him. Sagarika, yes, Sagarika. I must ask you. Uh, Vajpayee spoke famously about insaniyat, jamburiyat, Kashmiriyat as the way forward for Kashmir. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate on his approach? On his yes, approach. Yes, I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, he made that very famous speech uh, in Kashmir in 2003 when he went and spoke in chaste Urdu. You know, Vajpayee was very good in Urdu. Uh, and he uh, spoke about Kashmiriyat, Jamhuriyat, uh, Insaniyat. Uh, before that, he had actually overseen the elections of 2002, uh, which had brought the PDP government of Mufti Muhammad Sahib to power. And uh, he had overseen the free and fair elections of those uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. And you know, it, until very recently, I mean, when I used to go to Kashmir, uh, you know, up until uh, 2014, 2015. Their favorite Indian Prime Minister, actually, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Vajpayee is extremely well regarded in Kashmir. Uh, he continually reached out in Kashmir. He realized that uh, you know the the way to create peace with Pakistan was through Kashmir. He was not in favor of Article three seventy. He wanted Article three seventy to be done away with. He he was he was a critic of the Nehruvian approach to uh, Kashmir. He thought there had been a lot of uh, mistakes made in kashmir remember the janasang uh, slogan in the 1950s was ek desh mein do pradhan do nishan nahi chalega do 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 pradhan do nishan uh, nahi chalega to uh, he, you know, he, he didn't approve of conceding the kind of autonomy that uh, that um, nehru had given to kashmir the say you know a prime minister of kashmir a flag of kashmir a constitution for kashmir ha एक एक देश में दो प्रधान दो निशान दो संविधान नहीं चलेगा यू नो दिस वाज द दिस वाज द जनसंघ मोटो श्यामा प्रसाद मुखर्जी इज मोटो एंड श्यामा प्रसाद मुखर्जी एज यू नो इन इन एंगेज इन दैट पदयात्रा टू कश्मीर एंड ही ब्रोक द लॉ ऑफ दैट यू नीडेड अ परमिट टू एंटर कश्मीर सो ही एंटर कश्मीर विदाउट अ परमिट एंड देन ऑफ कोर्स ही वाज टेकन टू जेल इन कश्मीर एंड देन एक्सपायर्ड इन कश्मीर सो कश्मीर वाज very dear to vajpai and he he was a critic of the nehruvian approach but you know the idea for him was 370 dheere dheere ghis jayega you know the idea was to uh, was to put people first you know it, it was always put people first not the heavy hand of state power or executive diktat which would make uh, Uh, which would uh, push forward uh, policy it was putting the people first he felt that you know through people to people contact through uh, people to people dialogue the 370 would become irrelevant and there would be no need to uh, to have any kind of uh, executive uh, you know executive legislative fiat to do away with it so i believe he put people to people contact first he put the democratic process in kashmir first um you know when he received the outstanding parliamentarian award he received it in 1994 he said that i will always keep this award with me because it will remind me that whatever i do in whatever action i take i will put democracy first because we have to always protect democracy that's the only thing that you know that uh, that's the thing we have to protect so uh, i think his approach would have been democratic his approach would have been certainly to do away with article 370 uh, certainly to do away with any special status for kashmir but to do it through people to people action you know he was a believer in this people to people action and the and in the and in rolling back the state i think vajpai i think the, you know as as dr kelkar is saying the 
economic miracle uh, of the Vajpayee era was made possible because I think Vajpayee was really a genuine liberal on the economy. He just did not believe that the state should be involved uh, in the economy beyond a point. So he believed in, you know, in pushing state power back, pushing state power back from the economy, pushing it back from the life of the people. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and so therefore reawakening the democratic process in Kashmir. I think that would have been his solution. Right, right. right. So are there a lot of questions? I see there are 16 questions. In the well, actually, yeah, we were uh, short. Uh, right. have, unfortunately, we have run out of time now. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I was, uh, you know, I think the favorite story in a way, which is a story which should, because as journalists and Abhay and I both have, I mean, uh, you know, one of the difficulties we have of adjusting from the Vajpayee era to the present era is that the openness of the communication and the fact that leaders, uh, you know, genuinely saw themselves as uh, as uh, as people, uh, as leaders who wanted to reach out uh, to uh, to the media. And there's a story, of course, of uh, uh, Vajpayee, which you have in your book, which is my favorite anecdote of him, when uh, he calls up the All India Institute of uh, Medical <laughs> Science. Yes. To suggest that, you know, it reveals that at the end of the day, individuals were relatively humble and had their feet on the ground, so this unlike is, politicians this today. Is a, this is a hilarious story when, uh, you know, it was 1991 when Vajpayee was in the, uh, he was actually in the wilderness. He, he had not yet won the election in Lucknow. Uh, so it was in 1990, 1991. Those were the era, you know, from the late 80s to the, in the uh, 19 to late 80s to 1996 was Vajpayee's era in the wilderness. And um, he was tough, suffering from stomach pain. Uh, on one occasion and late at night he was suffering from stomach pain and he rang up the All India Institute of Medical Sciences uh, saying I'm suffering from stomach pain and the nurse said Aap kaun bol rahe so he said I'm Atal Bihari Vajpayee bol raha and the nurse said Achha, to main Hema Malini bol rahi and, she up. <laughs> <laughs> and Vajpayee couldn't understand and he rang up again rang up and she again said I'm Hema Malini and banged on the phone and then after that his um, uh, son-in-law Ranjan Bhattacharya said that Babji, dekhi, aap, you are so famous. You, you know, she, she said you are Atal Bihari Vajpayee. So she says she's Hema Malini. You should be complimented. So then he realized that he was, you know, his name was <laughs> was uh, was well known. <laughs> great, great story. So uh, I think yeah. uh, I think we can go on another two hours. Uh, oh no, I know. But, so uh, sir, we will. Uh, we have this. to. But, yeah, we this. I can answer the questions actually because uh, uh, in the, if. Uh, uh, if if you email me these questions, I can. Maybe... Yeah, we'll, we can do that. Yeah, yeah. We'll, do we'll, that. Do that. we'll do that. We'll send it. So uh, we'll bring this uh, program to a close. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sagarika and Rajdeep, for sharing your thoughts, for sharing such deep insights into the biography that you've written and into the personality of Mr. Vajpayee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mashelkar and Dr. Kelkar, for sharing your rich memories. Uh, as we close, I would just like to. Uh, quote one poem that uh, Sagarika has uh, quoted in a book, uh, which really she says is one of Vajpayee's favorite poems, and he got a lot of solace from his poems. And this is Kya Har Me, Kya Jeet Me, Kinchit Nahi Bhaibit Me, Sangharsh Pat Par Jobi Mile, Ye Bi Sahi, Wo Bi Sahi. The English translation says, Neither in victory nor in defeat am I ever afraid. Whatever comes my way in the path of struggle, all is fair, all is fine by me. So that's a wonderful poem you've quoted, Sagarika. And I would like to thank uh, the members of our audience for their questions. I would like to mention that our next program is on April 8th at 6 p.m. This is uh, the talk on uh, atheism uh, by Dr. Shantanu Abhyankar, writer, orator, blogger. Uh, the event will be chaired by Dr. Latika Padnaukar. He will be speaking to us on atheism under the series India and the World's Great Religions. You are aware that uh, Justice Nariman and uh, Ambassador Pawan Verma have been among the 10 speakers who have spoken in this series before. So we look forward to this event. And when, with this, I declare that this program has come to an end. Uh, wishing all of you a uh, very happy Gudi Padwa in Ramadan, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.